Thank you so much, Sarah. Can you hear me all right? Loud and clear, thank you. Wonderful. Uh, I'm Leah Grenier Kennedy and I'm coming to you from Stonington, Connecticut today and I'm really excited to be a part of this series. Today we're going to be exploring designing effective online assessment tasks for interpretive, interpersonal, and the presentational modes. So um, I wanted to um, just advance here. Uh, let you know that I am a practitioner in the fields, just as all of you are. I teach both French and Spanish. I'm also an administrator, and I serve on uh, several boards, uh, two of which are the NADSFL board and also president-elect of CT Colt. So I'm very much in the practitioner side uh, of uh, your world, and so everything that I'm going to be sharing with you today is uh, indeed the things I'm working with in my own classes. So before we go any further, I'd like to thank the NFLRC for all the contributions that you make to our field. Uh, it is a, a wonderful uh, series that you have offered. So I would like to offer the following prompt today that um, we consider how do we build online assessments in alignment with the world readiness standards to reflect teaching toward proficiency in all three modes of communication. So to that end, I would like to recap where you've come from in these past weeks. You were able to start with Meg Malone, uh, exploring the fundamental concepts of assessment to provide a foundation for, for, for your learning in this series. And then you were able to continue on with Fernando Rubio, uh, looking at what does second, acquisition, second language acquisition look like? And so being mindful of the input, the output, the interaction that's needed, and how do we provide feedback to our students in this online environment in order to see that they're going to continue to make the proficiency gains. Um, he also really led us down the path, it, getting us to understand why it is so important to assess. Assessment is really for the learner. The assessment is not for the teacher. It, it is the learner being able to say, where am I going? How am I doing? And where to next? Especially in the online community where so many of your students are highly motivated to take on these courses on their own time to learn independently. So how do we allow for the teaching and the testing to become part of the same process in the online environment? Uh, in order to make that happen, we obviously need to be working within the three modes, keeping assessment at the, at the center point, but making sure that we're blending activities. So as we get to the later portion of the webinar today, I will be looking at how we can move from the interpretive mode and then make it into an interpersonal task or move from the interpretive mode into a presentational task. So uh, again, that was something that was uh, already discussed with Fernando Rubio in your previous webinar. You then were able to move on to working with uh, Jennifer Eddy, also from the next full region, about the importance of backward planning and allowing uh, us to unpack the standards through backward planning. So I think that today uh, will be, uh, there will be a big emphasis on the backward planning due to the fact that we're gonna be looking at building of IPAs, integrated performance assessments. And so uh, they will be used, as Jennifer said, as a blueprint for creating meaningful and effective and relevant tasks. Uh, your last uh, session that you had was also uh, with um, J.D. Brown, and he was able to share with you the importance of using rubrics and scoring guides to provide feedback to the learner. Uh, I think that the use of both holistic and analytic rubrics are really important for, for the students. And he did also uh, give some time to the fact that we need to train students to use these so that they can guide their own learning as well, which I do think is an important aspect of the online community. Community. So I stopped here to make meaning of your learning. So um, I'm, I'm happy that I was able to recap in case you were looking for some notes from your for your three, two, one activity. So now what we're going to do is we're going to make meaning of the learning that you already have from your previous webinars and look at how do we apply that to building an IPA um, that will be used in order to help students grow in all three of the modes. So today, we're going to be looking at how do we use the world readiness standards uh, for online language learning to plan effective curriculum assessment and instruction. And also, how do we describe how to determine evidence of learning based on a proficiency level in an online environment. And finally, 
How do we design effective online learning experiences and assessments through an integrated performance assessment? So these are our three goals uh, for our session today. And, uh, and so with that, I'd like to start with looking at our world readiness standards. The world readiness standards are basically the what. The, the what of where we're gonna start our planning. So if you uh, look at these goal areas, we have five of them, as you know, and the first one is communication. So moving between interpersonal, interpretive, and presentational communication, we move on to cultures, connections, comparisons, and communities. In all of these goal areas, it is important to note that the learners are using the language, using the language to investigate, using the language to build or to access and evaluate information. Obviously, that would also be the case with uh, communication. So if we look at these standards, we can see that interpersonal communication is when the learners are interacting and negotiating meeting in spoken, signed, or written conversations to share information, reactions, feelings, and opinions. This is often uh, seen as an easier task to uh, put together in a face-to-face -face environment as opposed to an online classroom. However, there are lots of tools that we can use to really leverage this, um, this mode of communication that we'll discuss today. The interpretive is when the learners understand, interpret, and analyze what is heard, read, or viewed on a variety of topics. And the presentational is when learners present information, concepts, and ideas to inform, explain, persuade, and narrate on a variety of topics using appropriate media and adapting to various audiences of listeners, readers, or viewers. So as we look at these goal areas, the challenge for us is to figure out how we can integrate all of the five C's into our lessons and to do so in a meaningful, meaningful and authentic way for all of our learners. If you're looking for more information about the World Readiness Standards, this is a short video clip that I find to be very helpful uh, in sharing with stakeholders or, or, uh, or learners as they'd like to learn a little bit more about this. So moving from the standards, the standards give us a pathway. It shows us how to teach toward proficiency. And it encourages us to do several things. Shift away from our traditional building block approach, which many of us suffered through as learners if, uh, if you have learned a language uh, in past decades. It also encourages us to move toward what students can do with the language. Um, we're gonna be talking about functions. That's the functional approach. That's the what you can use in the can do statements document. Um, also to build language, to build independence so students can use the language for authentic purposes. And they also encourage us to align assessments to proficiency to support each of the five goal areas. So what are the implications for assessment? Well, it means that we're going to be assessing things in a different way. I love this image that was created by Chantal Thompson from Brigham Young University because it reminds us of our duty to balance our assessments, to be sure that we are addressing the functions, the text type, the accuracy, and the content and the context. So as we look at this image of the tree, we see that the trunk is the sturdy, the important part of the tree, the strength of the tree, and that is uh, the functions. So as we look at how we can build the competence of our learners, it's about increasing the number of functions that they can do. So what are functions? Well, there are a variety of them that we can do at all proficiency levels, and there are they will be done with increased degrees of competence as they gain in the text type and they gain in the ability to express themselves in extended discourse. So these are some of the functions that we can be looking at. As we're assessing them, it is important to make sure that our assessments and our instruction are also both driven by the functions. So looking at what we're designing for our daily uh, formative assessments and for our summative assessments, we really want to be focused on the functions first. So as, uh, as Fernando Rubio said, the assessment 
is really for the student to be able to understand where to next. So it is really important that this language is shared with the students, so that the students have a sense of um, how well the learner is meeting the goals. How are we making teaching and testing all part of the same process? How can the students set goals to move up the proficiency scale? When the students understand the world readiness standards, when the students understand the proficiency levels, they are equipped with the language needed to be able to uh, set goals for assessment in order to continue their growth. Um, that is part of giving them the roadmap of helping them to understand where to next. One of the ways that we can empower students is by giving them uh, the can-do statements. They're currently being revised uh, and the new version is expected out anytime now. So I would encourage you to give those statements to students so that students can start to have ownership of their learning and ownership of the functions that they would like to be able to have as a, a language learner. Uh, I use them with my students on a regular basis. As you can see here, this is a copy uh, from last year where students would uh, check off indicators showing their growth in each of the different modes at different points during the year. And then at the bottom of the second page, you can see that they are setting goals based on the next uh, sub-level of proficiency in order to uh, determine where they would like to go next. So that brings us back to Jennifer Eddy's uh, presentation on backward design. Any good instruction is going to work with the backward design model and be able to give us uh, a, a real chance to focus on what are our desired end results. Then we're gonna stop and look at what is the acceptable evidence to show that the learners have met those results. And then we're gonna plan the learning experiences and the instruction. This is really the, the backbone of the IPA, of the Integrated Performance Assessment. So we're going to start by looking at our results, then we're going to be moving on to evidence, how do you know, and then we're going to be planning the learning experiences. So where do we get these resources? Well, the goals are in the standards and in the learning targets. The evidence would be found in the can-do statements or in assessments. And the learning experiences and instruction are, are learning activities and our language elements. If we are starting with our world readiness standards, the next step is to make sure that we are understanding the actual proficiency guidelines. That is what the students need to understand as well as the teachers so that we can be sure that they know where they're going to next with their assessment. So as we're looking at these proficiency levels, we're looking at ways that we can show that novice learners have evidence that they have mastered uh, the task that we are going to give to them. So here's an example, a list of things that novice learners can do. Intermediate learners can now create with language and ask and answer simple questions on familiar topics. Now, all of these documents can be found on the ACTFL website. Uh, I do think that these are critical components to understand well before we start building the IPA. Uh, your intermediate learners compared to your advanced learners, you can see on this slide here what the differences are in terms of what we are asking the student to be able to do. So again, these are things that uh, are obviously very familiar documents to everyone, but I do think that it is important to reflect on them and to go back and look at the can-do statements in order to be sure that we are um, aligning our tasks and our summative assessments uh, with the uh, ability and the targeted levels of the students. So, uh, so I'm gonna leave all of this information in the handouts, uh, but I do wanna be able to move on to the IPA because I think that this will be the crux of uh, where you're gonna be working with uh, building your online assessments. So if you're gonna start building an IPA, I think that there is a really important resource called the Keys to Planning for Learning, and that was written by Donna Clementi and Laura Terrell. Um, you can get the ebook at the link down below, but I do think that it is one of the 
uh, easiest ways for you to start building an IPA if you have not started doing so thus yet. So what are you going to do if you're going to start uh, building an IPA? Well, you're going to start with the end goals in mind, as we talked about with the uh, backward planning. So we're going to start with the culture, the motivation. How are we going to hook these students? Um, as, uh, as online learners, you have many students in your classes who are really committed to being able to use the language for interpersonal communication, to be able to travel, to be able to explore. Um, so how can we hook them with culture in order to motivate our learners? Then you're going to take time to identify the summative performance assessment. So how will we know if they have reached the success? Well, this is going to be the starting point of your planning. And then working backwards, you'll create meaningful tasks, uh, practice activities to help the learners get there. And finally, you will determine what tools are needed for success. What are those language elements? What are the functions? What are the grammatical structures? What is the priority vocabulary? And then in what content? So this is in a nutshell, how you would start planning uh, your IPA. This is a sample template uh, that you can use as, uh, as an idea of how we're going to move forward. If you go on to uh, the Wikispaces page that I included from Laura Terrell, she has an abundant amount of resources and examples of IPAs that will serve you well in your planning. This is one of her samples here about belonging and identity. So if that is uh, the uh, essential question, how do my family, friends, and where I live influence my free time activities, that will then ask me as a teacher to, to look for what is, how am I going to know if the students have arrived? What are the summative performance tasks that I would like to have in all three modes? What are the can-do statements that are related to those summative performance tasks. And then as you can see at the, at the bottom part, what are the supporting functions, the structures or grammar that you would need and also the priority vocabulary. And so for any of you who may be um, uh, graduates of high school from 20, 30, or even 40 years ago, you may remember that this paradigm was completely switched. We started with our grammar and vocabulary lists. And it, the entire model was the opposite of what you see here. So you're going to start first with your essential question. That is the leading with the culture, hooking the learners with the engaging essential question and theme that Jennifer Eddy um, explained so clearly in her webinar. It will then uh, obviously be that the language will follow. We're going to give them opportunities in all three modes to grow their language in order to support uh, the essential question and theme of, of the culture. So as you can see here, you're going to start with a blank summative performance task and then start to identify in all three modes what it is that you would like to have the students do to answer the question, how do my family, friends, and where I live influence my free time activities? As you can see here, uh, these are samples from Laura Terrell's uh, website, the wiki spaces that I had mentioned, and you can see that there are different tasks for each of the three modes. These do not have to be completed on the same day. They can be done at different times, and I do have some rubrics to uh, further support what J.D. Brown uh, was sharing with you last week in order to assess and give feedback on how the students are doing in all three modes. Um, so, as you can see here, the next thing that you will do is look for key learning activities, formative assessments that you will do uh, in order to support the task. Um, so these will be done in all three modes of communication. They may allow for, as you can see, some of them uh, have interpretive, interpersonal, and presentational mo modes of communication. And that is something that you can do as you're moving in and out, blending the activities from the three modes. So, um, 
so the, the next thing that you're going to do is stop and look at uh, the tools that you're going to be needing for success. So I'm currently in the middle of an IPA about where do young people uh, around the world sleep. So they have been comparing homes and rooms of teenagers. And so you can see here that I have supporting functions is describing homes, comparing and contrasting. We're also looking at the tiny house movement. And then, so what does that mean for the supporting structures or the patterns? And then obviously what is the priority vocabulary when they're talking about housing and what, um, what young people have in their rooms around the world. So that will be the last part that I'm going to address, not the first part. So again, it is a complete paradigm switch um, for those of us who were, were trained it in earlier decades. Um, so as you can see here, I'm going back to um, sharing with you uh, the example from Laura Terrell. You can see that she's listed functions of asking and responding to questions, expressing likes and dislikes. Again, the functions are driving the instruction because that is the measure of a, a language learner. Um, the toolbox then moves on to the related structures and patterns that will be needed. And you can see on the right is a priority vocabulary. Uh, there are a variety of sample units that you can use to, to base your ideas, and there are lists of essential questions that you can get yourself grounded in interesting essential questions to help hook these learners and help them to become engaged in, in their learning. Um, putting it all together, um, the main uh, thing that we really need to make sure that we're clear on is setting the performance and the proficiency target. Until teachers and students have a clear understanding of the proficiency levels, it is very difficult to set a target. So the reason that I started with the world readiness standards and then the proficiency levels was to draw attention to the fact that you cannot set a target until you have a really clear sense of what each of the uh, proficiency levels does and then also um, even better understanding of the of the sub levels so um, I think if there's one way that I've really been able to help my students uh, internalize that language it has been through the can-do statements I have found that to be a really helpful tool and a way for them to help set goals so that they can see oh this is what an intermediate mid looks like I've got my eyes on intermediate high and this is what I need to do in order to get there um, then the next thing is to identify what students will need to be successful so stopping to think about what are those functions uh, what are the structures, the patterns, and the vocabulary that are going to make them um, have success within this unit? And then finally, to be specific in setting the unit goals, to describe those overarching performance goals um, so that the students will know what they're going to do and they will be able to get feedback specifically on the functions that they are um, that they're mastering. Um, so if uh, I were looking for resources for you, I would certainly suggest exploring OFLA's, it's an Ohio Foreign Language Association's uh, website. They have an IPA tech live binder. This is sorted by theme, by modes, uh, technology tools, and I find them to be uh, very rich in resources, both for online and for face-to-face. -face. Uh, obviously, you can sort by language, as you can see on the right side as well. Um, all of these links are uh, in the dig deeper section that uh, you will receive as well. Okay, so, so the last part that we wanted to look at here was how to design effective online learning experiences and assessments um, in each of the modes. So in this portion of the webinar, I would love to give some ideas about how to support each of the modes um, with regards to uh, formative assessments. The, the first mode is interpersonal. And I think we, we really need to stop and, and spend a little bit of extra time on interpersonal when it comes to the online learning environment. It does pose a definite, definite challenges as Fernando Rubio addressed in his webinar. 
Um, however, there are some real affordances that the technology does allow for. So as I look at these real world contexts for interpersonal, it's the small talk, getting to know someone, making plans, making a purchase, ordering in a restaurant, making an appointment, texting, interviewing someone, uh, completing a transaction. As you look at these contexts, I think that many of your online learners are, are very much driven to be able to, to do these activities. And as part of the reason why they're taking time to do their courses um, online, maybe in addition to a job that they're already doing, um, in order to be able to do this for business or work or or their career. Um, so as we look at this list, some of these things are much easier in a face-to-face -face class. However, there are plenty of them that are easily done uh, through technology. So let's take a look here. Um, one thing that I think helps the interpersonal mode is, uh, is using graphic organizers. If you go to the Carla website, you will find an abundance of graphic organizers. This is just a screenshot of the, the top uh, five graphic organizers available, but there are many graphic organizers. And in order to, go back to this real world context, in order to do some of these things, it does help if they're uh, using a graphic organizer to start organizing their thoughts before entering into the interpersonal activity. So it is basically the preparation for a conversation that, um, that can actually help them to get through some of those tasks. So I would encourage using uh, graphic organizers for some of your interpersonal activities. Um, I also do a lot of uh, YouTube clips. I upload them to Google, Google Classroom. I will upload them with a Google Doc, having the students do a prompt about something that they learned in the interpretive mode. So here's one where they're, they're looking at different places to visit uh, and then why. So whatever the, uh, the video clip is, it's easy to put the students into partners and then have them discuss where are the destinations that you would like to visit or uh, after viewing this video, what was your learning? What is your opinion going into a persuasive um, a, a persuasive piece or what have you? So here are some of the ways that I use it. I do have uh, completed graphic organizers um, and then I have them um, upload and share them with me to show me what their learning is as they're getting the main ideas, um, as they're listening to the recordings. I, I may also say for another interpersonal activity, submit a voice recording of a partner conversation. Uh, I do this sometimes in class and so the class ones um, it's pretty easy with a, a voice memo, uh, but online, it could be through Skype, it could be through Google Hangouts where they record a conversation and, um, and then they can submit that, um, or they could do a paired video conversation. So depending on what my goal is uh, for collecting the evidence, um, there are lots of ways that I can allow the students to have that interpersonal experience um, in a way that is meaningful, but it's also in a way that I can get them to change their partners, which is of utmost importance when you're in the online uh, community because it helps reduce the isolation that students feel. Um, there are uh, lots of Lots of samples here to show you a variety of interpersonal tasks. As you can see, they're sorted by novice, intermediate, intermediate, high to advanced. And so you can see that the, um, the uh, functions are clearly described and the ability to which they are using those functions uh, will continue to grow as they move up. Um, but again, getting back to knowing our proficiency levels, we can't craft these activities until we have uh, the ability to set the proficiency targets in a way that is accurate for the students. Um, interpersonal scoring guides. I have probably about 10 different interpersonal scoring guides that I just photocopy and I leave uh, on my table. So I'm constantly giving them feedback on how to move up the proficiency scale. Here is one uh, that was developed by Donna Clementi and Paul Sandrock. 
Here is another one that was also developed by Donna Clementi and Paul Sandrock. Um, again, I use these as I'm grading. Uh, I just got uh, a whole series of interpersonal uh, conversations that were sent to my inbox. And so I'll have this scoring guide and I'll go through and say, well, actually I can say always for staying in the target language, uh, staying on task always, but maybe there was no evidence of, um, of encouraging each other, or maybe there's no evidence of solving a problem. So, so there, this allows me to give the students feedback and, um, having a variety of scoring guides and rubrics is very helpful to me, but it's also helpful to the students to be able to see where they need to um, improve their performance. Uh, moving on to presentational mode, we want to go back to that real world context again. As you can see from this list, there are um, lots of opportunities here that would really lend themselves to the to the online classroom. Um, so the question is, how do we do this in a way that is uh, engaging, based on authentic resources, and allows for uh, students to elaborate and to be able to um, move to the next sub-level of proficiency. So here are some examples of presentational tasks. You can see on the left is the function to persuade, to explain or inform, to narrate. And here's what it looks like at the novice level, the intermediate level, and the advanced level. And I, I included these so that you would have a variety of tasks to, to lean back on. As you can see, um, there are um, plenty that really reflect the online classroom um, in, in a way that is meaningful for your students. Looking at the interpretive task, um, the, the question with the interpretive task is to look at the authentic sources. That is, um, I would say, a, a real strength in the online classroom because that is where we're going to get most of our authentic resources. So finding those resources um, is, is really key to the student engagement. And then we stop and ask ourselves, um, what is essential to demonstrate about understanding? What is the prompt? And how will you elicit what the learners understand? So um, focusing on good questioning after interpretive tasks is really a key component here. Um, it's not only about the questioning, it's also about choosing uh, a graphic organizer or some sort of organizer that helps the student take notes or capture what they have learned. Um, there is um, there are a variety of ways that you could do this through authentic texts, and um, and I would say one of the ways that I use frequently would be uh, posting to Twitter, having the students come up with a message to distill what their essential learning is, uh, having them read an article, and then just write. Uh, a, a, a post back to the person who has posted the article in the target language saying why they enjoyed the article, what were the main ideas that they took away from the article. So there are lots of ways to, to leverage those authentic texts and have the students then move from interpretive reading or interpretive listening into presentational writing. Um, finding authentic texts uh, is it is a, a, a challenge for certain languages and uh, much easier for other languages. So if you look at some of these tips here, um, I would say that one of my starting points is, is either Pinterest or Twitter is usually um, a, a good starting spot for me, but uh, doing searches in the target language uh, is always a great way to get at those authentic texts. But um, the beauty of Pinterest is that we have so many colleagues that are out there populating boards that are really specific to, um, to the various topics that we're interested in it, it is really important. Um, so there are, once you start following um, different boards, you will see that there are 
prolific pinners out there um, who are more than happy to share entire boards with you if you reach out to them. Uh, Leslie Gron is somebody that I did include in my list of resources, and she has uh, a, a plethora of topics that you can choose from. Uh, there is also Catherine Ritz, who I included, and, uh, and Laura Terrell. So you can be able to uh, look at some of the things that she has designed for IPAs as well. Um, so when we look at the real world context for interpretive, um, there are so many ways that it is um, actually easier to leverage the interpretive through the online uh, courses than it is in the uh, in the face-to-face -face classes. The interpretive mode is a time where students can listen to it multiple times or view it or uh, multiple times. And that does help reduce the anxiety that students uh, have when they're hearing it for the first time in the classroom. So that is an advantage uh, that the online students do have. Um, so after the reading, uh, going back to some of these graphic organizers, this is another one from Carla, um, thinking about what you want to have them capture to show that they are making progress towards, um, towards that goal. Predicting. So when you're looking at uh, predicting, uh, take any sort of possible content, put that on the left, either it's in the article or it's not in the article. Um, that's another way to capture what they have, uh, what they have done. Um, and then when you're looking at guiding the interpretive performance, um, I use a lot of the documents from, um, and I've adapted them from Common Core State Standards uh, for ELA. So I have built close reading guides to help students look for the main idea and then look for the details that support each of the main ideas. Look for textual evidence um, to be able to um, understand the article. Um, shared documents. Uh, that, that's a great way to get students to comment on each other's understanding. So for example, if you uh, have a jigsaw document that you share with the classes, when the students read the article, they can each put their ideas about what they learned, or they could read three different articles on the same topic, and then they each share the main ideas from the document. And so the peers are able to support one another by adding to that. Um, graphic organizers is something that I keep coming back to because I think that they're varying the graphic organizers and the uses of them is a really important way to get students uh, to keep making meaning. And then uh, finally, uh, digital gallery walks. So the, the gallery walk that we would do at a conference or in a classroom where the students physically move about the room adding to a poster paper, you can do the same thing for a digital gallery walk and allow students to make comments on, uh, on different aspects of the learning. Um, I, I am, uh, speaking to you uh, from the perspective of a teacher who is working each day to design lessons that will engage the students. So I am happy to answer questions and also to share more resources. Um, I am uh, pinning a, a good amount on Pinterest. I'm also um, building my network through Twitter, which I cannot emphasize enough to all of you out there. That is where we can all get so many resources from each other and, and really share that creative burden of designing things that will really engage our students. So, um, so with that being said, I am uh, more than happy to answer questions now, and, uh, and I thank you all for, um, for attending today.